Angela. Go ahead. I would say Angela brought up a good point where we were talking about it after I got back and she's saying how, you know, because I, I, I can attest to this too. A lot of my patients that are elderly, that are living alone, they often don't feel like going into a lot of trouble cooking because they're just cooking for themselves. So a lot of them are just eating, you know, TV dinners, you know, stuff they can throw in the microwave, which is highly processed and, and uh, very, you know, salty and things like that. So, um, so to be able to provide some of those meals would be much healthier than what they would, would have been getting otherwise. Yes, true. So I see one old name or one new name that I have in common. And I don't know if it's a relative or not, or whether that's a first name. <laughs> you see it, Scott? Unmute. Uh, it's my first name. <laughs> so, oh, oh, okay. We're, we're, we're related, but further back. <laughs> oh, further back? <laughs> okay, well, uh, <laughs> we're happy to have you. Did you have a doctor who recommended these meetings, or how'd you find out about them? Uh, Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim. Is that a doctor at Oregon Medical Group, Scott? No, no, that's, that's Kim right over there somewhere. Kim Clark, my friend. Oh, Dr. Kim Clark. Uh, that must be uh, Kim from here, right? One of the classes. So Kim, thank you for sending Ross or encouraging him to attend. Uh, so, yeah, welcome. <laughs> okay, Kim, that's our um, our brawl expert. <laughs> I think I oh, finally right. learned. Uh, anybody else new? I think we've seen most of the other names here and people, and so we're pretty good to go. Is that going to be on the test? Yeah. So yeah, the test that's coming up in a few weeks. What? What's Brule? Brule? The Brule Bowl? Yeah, that'll be on the test, uh, but, but Kim can help you. It's it's an open book test, so you'll be able to ask yeah. about it. Is it administered by by the uh, plant based police? Yeah, <laughs> very cute. I like it. We so, won't be there that day. Yeah, <laughs> All right. you might be sick. <laughs> So maybe Scott could start out the meeting telling you about the um, uh, kitchen that we visited today and you know, kind of share with you, for those of you who are living in the Eugene Springfield area, what that's all about. And then we'll carry on with this open foreign forum meeting, see, answer your questions and stuff. Yeah, so Charlie and I and, uh... Uh, Debbie and uh, actually uh, Dr. Colgrove's wife, Akinyi, uh, we were there representing Eugene plant-based providers, our you know, sister group with the, these classes. And we were invited to have a meeting with uh, the Positive Community Kitchen, which is in Eugene. And they've been around since about 2013. So they're, they're a nonprofit. They cook, they, it's all volunteer organization. They cook meals for for sick patients. So people that are mainly it's cancer patients, but anyone that like, you know, say for example, you were living alone and you had a hip surgery or some other kind of uh, uh, medical event and you were kind of had a hard time cooking for yourself for a period of time. So for up to 12 weeks, you can get free meals from them. So they deliver meals to, to you and they, uh, we, we toured their kitchen and uh, met with them today for a couple hours and they want to work with us because they have, you know, nutrition focus and uh, it's also community uh, uh, wellness focus. So it's, it's right up the alley of lifestyle medicine, what we teach in the classes and, 
and their meals, they showed us the, the foods they were cooking for this week. And there was 80, 80 pe uh, people that were going to be receiving their food this week. And they usually have anywhere between 80 and 100 and up to 140, I think they can accommodate in a week. And uh, they, uh, it was mostly all plant-based foods. It was, I mean, there was, it wasn't vegan. So there, they do have vegan options. If you were, I think I saw on the board for this week, they had like four or five that were vegetarian and one, one that was vegan. But if you look at what they were cooking for the week, it was, it was all plant-based. There was a little bit of there. I can't remember which meat, there was a meat goat and something. Cheese. Oh, there's goat cheese. That's what it was. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, not overall vegan, but they do uh, provide very, very healthy, mostly plant-based meals and, and uh, it's really great. So they're a really, really neat organization. I'll, I'll put up the link to their website eventually on our on our class website. And I'll have Sean probably put up their link on the Eugene plant-based providers. So, so just because it'd be a good, I think a good resource for people and, and people can volunteer there if they would like. And they, they do free classes for cooking. Uh, there's like a, mostly for adolescents, uh, high school and pre-teen They'll do uh, free cooking classes every week. And then I think they said once a month during the summer, they do a cooking class at the farmer's market uh, down downtown. And so so it's a way you can like, hey, like say you're trying to maybe you take the online switch uh, cooking class that's on the website, which is a free online cooking class. So say you're trying to cook more and be, and be more plant based, you can actually go there and um, you could actually volunteer to work in the kitchen and they, they'll kind of do on uh, real time teaching because they have a they have a chef there that's a volunteer and you can actually improve your own cooking skills just by volunteering your time helping them. So, uh, so it's pretty, pretty cool. And, and you and if you have a need, you can actually receive meals from them. I also was looking, spending a little time on their website today and I saw you could actually also, I think it was like $60, a little more expensive, but you could receive a, a week's worth of meals for $60. And what that does is you get the meals, but then somebody else gets the meals. So that, so you're paying for yourself, but you're paying for somebody else at the same time. So uh, even if you didn't have a, 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 a illness that you had a need, you could, I believe you can pay and get, get the meals as well. But, um, but yeah, it's a great, great service. And we're looking forward to working with them. What's the organization? Um, let's see, Dorothea first and then Marsha. Uh, what's the name of this organization? <laughs> po Positive Community Kitchen. There's a website, just positivecommunitykitchen.org is the website. Yeah, okay, Marsha. That was my question. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> They're, and they're right over there. They share a building with, uh, if you guys know where Hummingbird is, Hummingbird, that's, it was uh, that same building. They're, they share space with, with, with them there. Kind of over by where REI is and the, the climbing gym and what some other stuff that's over there. Uh, it's like Third Street, which is, it's not actually Third Street. But it's just across the train tracks there. It's the actual address is the Shelton house drive or whatever it's called but but it's, yeah it's over over there close to skinner's butte merrill go ahead thank you um will they make food um without oil would they make it for our needs or no they said that they would make uh vegan food for those who requested it now i we didn't go into the details so I think they, if you were pretty uh, act, you know, if you made it clear that you didn't want foods that had oil in them, they probably would try to accommodate that is what my guess is. I don't know for, sh for sure. What do you think, we, Scott? Yeah, we did talk to him today about sauteing with vegetable broth and stock and all that, because I know they, they do generally use oil, but... Uh, you know, they make stuff in big batches because it's for lots of people. So, so I guess I don't know the answer to that question. If they could keep it oil free, we know we could, they could do it vegan, but um, whether you, I mean, you could, yeah, it wouldn't hurt to ask if they could do <laughs> something without oil.
and they were uh, sounding like they're looking for some more people. So don't be shy. Yeah, it takes a hundred people to volunteer to do what, to produce what they produce as of, as of now. And they do a kind of these 12 week cycles, kind of like a season people, they'll kind of rotate different teams through. This kind of sounds like, but I think you can volunteer more than once, but it, uh, yeah, it sounds like they're, they have a definitely a need for anyone that has time to volunteer. They also do. Oh, sorry. I was, I was going to say that would be fun for a group of us to do sometime to volunteer, you know, instead of a, a walk, maybe, you know, on a rainy day or something, you know, anyway. It's a good thought. Uh, they also do uh, education for high school students, um, teaching them about nutrition. And uh, I don't know how often they do the classes, but sounded pretty good. Hey, Charlie, yes, in, Malachi, in Malachi's health class, he's a senior in high school. He was telling me that he's, they're learning about food right now and the teacher is teaching mostly plant-based education. Nice. So I thought that was cool. I'm thrilled to hear that as you yeah. probably are, are aware. Yeah, I thought that was awesome. Great. The world is changing. It hasn't changed fast enough for those of us who still keep speaking out, but it is changing, definitely. We see the wheel starting to turn. Anybody have any uh, questions, anything they wanna contribute to the group or you know, any thoughts about what's going on in their life or whatever, that's what these classes are for. They're for you and Scott and I are here to try to facilitate the discussion a bit. And for the new new people, I don't know how many new ones we have tonight. We, we're starting the whole class series over on January 3rd. So just a, several weeks from now, we'll be starting all over again. So these next, this tonight and the next three weeks will, will be these open forum formats for questions and whatever you guys wanna talk about. And then January 3rd, we'll start all over. I'll do my introduction class. And then the week after Charlie will do his and we'll start start over again charlie here um hank and i were discovered today and i told charlie this already that a uh, a year well starting tomorrow is our one year anniversary being on the program and we cannot get over how much better we feel and all the changes that are happening to us and weight loss for me is slow but i don't get a lot of exercise but it's everything else is just progressing so well. And um, we just, we want to thank you so much for, especially for being patient with us. <laughs> well, you've contributed a lot to the classes, um, encouragement to others, and uh, even participated in the medical school um, time. So we're grateful for you and happy for your feeling better. Kyra. I'm curious about what are some people's favorite lunches? Anybody can kind of speak to that. Velvet, go ahead. I do leftovers a lot from dinner. I tend to do that. Or I like ramen. So I've been making like, a, I've been like sauteing vegetables and vegetable broth and then um, just make your ramen noodles and vegetable broth too and then Pour it, I'll put a huge handful of spinach in there, a couple handfuls, and then just pour the broth and the noodles over it. That's a good one if you're at home. But leftovers is my go-to because I always have leftovers from dinner. Same with me, leftovers for dinner. And yeah. Lent, lentil soup last night, and I'm taking it for lunch tomorrow. <laughs> or salads is always a good one. I know, like, you know. I don't like to say salad because I don't want people to think they always have to eat salad, but salad is always a good one. And remember, if you're going to eat a salad, you may want to incorporate more than just the greens and the veggies. You may want to incorporate a serving of uh, uh, legumes with that, uh, either beans or 
lentils, or you may want to incorporate some quinoa or rice or um, some other whole grain uh, along with it, and then uh, have some fruit. So, you know, eating out of the four categories, uh, the legumes, beans and lentils, or uh, fruits or vegetables or whole grains. If you kind of pick from each of those categories, you could do that. We do that for breakfast. Um, we eat a breakfast lunch together, a brunch, uh, which is combined all those things and probably as much as we would normally eat for breakfast and lunch together. And then we eat again a dinner. So not everybody has to eat three meals. Some people eat two. Uh, some people eat less than that a day, but if you're trying to lose weight, remember Dr. Greger says eating your food earlier in the day uh, works better for your circadian rhythms and uh, you burn up more calories the more you load your food during the day as opposed to the evening hours. Another tip for salads is I roast my chickpeas in my air fryer. Just put seasoning on them and I use a little bit of vegetable broth to make the seasoning stick and then just throw it in my air fryer and that, that's good on salads. Or um, taco salad is really good because then you can do like quinoa and beans and then tomatoes and onion and stuff. That's great. No, it's like no, it's like yeah, no, it's like uh, the, the tofu sour cream. So when I ever I do tacos or a taco salad, I love the, to the tofu sour cream. It's just, you know, you get those uh, little blue containers of silken tofu firm. I get, we get them at Market of Choice and you put two of those in a blender and then it's two tablespoons of uh, apple cider vinegar and, and or no, uh, uh, le lemon, two tablespoons of lemon juice and two tablespoons of, uh, of, uh, is it apple cider? Yeah, no, red wine vinegar. Yeah, red wine vinegar, two tablespoons and two tablespoons of lemon juice. Put that in there and then you just blend it and then you chill it for about an hour and it's it's the same. It's a lot like sour cream. It doesn't, of course, it doesn't taste like sour cream, but you, once you use it, have used it a few times and, you, and you've given up regular sour cream, that's it has the same texture, the creaminess, it, anything I used to put sour cream on, that's what I use now. There's, we always have a tub of it in the in our refrigerator every week because I'll put it on my salads to kind of make it a more creamy dressing. I was, I'll put, usually put on balsamic vinegar and then I'll add a couple scoops of the tofu sour creams and it makes a more creamy dressing or I'll put it on my tacos or my burritos or a taco salad or something like that along with some salsa and red sauce if it's a taco salad. What is it you would put on stuff? A tofu sour cream. It, the recipe is in Forks Over Knives cookbook but it's as simple as, as the, like I said, two tablespoons lemon juice, two tablespoons red wine vinegar, and then the two containers of the, of the tofu, tofu, silken tofu firm in, in the blender. And that's it. And you just chill it yeah. in the refrigerator. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Okay, Something Edward. It doesn't say stay um, moist or not moist, but I don't know. I'm not sure what to. Call. I have to stir it up sometimes, I guess. Yeah, you got to stir it up. It gets watery in the middle. You have to stir it before, after it sits for a bit. You got to stir or it up each time. It gets kind of dry or something. Yeah. Mine gets watery. So it, it'll, it'll get be watery if it sits for a while. Then you just stir it up and it's fine. Okay. okay. All right, Edward and then Meryl. So without butter or oil, how do I get anything to stick to popcorn? Water. So, it, so if you have an air air popper, and mm -hmm. the and the air, the popcorn's coming out into the bowl, every so often take a take a water bottle with a really fine spritz, and then you spritz oh, some water. Understand. Yeah, spritz some water onto the popcorn, and then throw on the the nutritional yeast, and then just periodically spritz of water, nutritional yeast, more popcorn, spritz of water, nutritional yeast, and then the, that makes it tacky. So then it, the nutritional yeast oh. will stick to it. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah. Meryl. So a couple of things. First off, I make a tofu mayonnaise. So um, similar to your sour cream, Scott, um, I don't know the exact recipes. I change it all the time. Usually there's a little bit of mustard in there. 
Um, and But all the plant-based bloggers have recipes online, so it's easy to find. The other thing is you asked about what to put on popcorn. I've used pickle juice and sprayed it on popcorn. And that yeah. gives a lot of flavor. I mean, obviously there's some salt in there too, but because you're spraying, you don't use a lot. And that adds a nice flavor to mm -hmm. popcorn. And, and when I do pickle juice, I often use dill, um, dill weed. Lemon or lime juice sounds good too. Yeah, that would be good. I think about it. Nice. Great. Okay, Kim. Uh, unmute yourself. So for lunch, um, have you ever tried the um, mashed um, garbanzo beans um, to make it like a tuna salad on like rice cakes? I do that a lot. Or I roast a bunch of vegetables at the beginning of the week and then have the brol that I'm always pushing um and make a bowl with it so that's what i had for dinner tonight just a bunch of roasted vegetables and the brol as my grain and you can put anything you want with it and fresh stuff and also i find that i i make a lot of um cucumber tomato and onion salad and if you just use rice wine vinegar it's and a little bit of salt and pepper it's perfect you don't need any oil you don't need anything so that's a really light easy delicious salad so Thank you. So there was an ask about, has anyone found an oil-free butter recipe? And the thing that comes to my mind when I think of using something buttery, I think of hummus. And uh, if you want it oil-free, you probably have to make it yourself, uh, but you grind up garbanzo beans and put in whatever flavor you want, garlic, onions, or pepper, or whatever, and you leave out the tahini, and you can have something with a texture that's fairly similar to butter. Charlie? Yes. Um, I'm new to this, so I'm just learning how to swap out foods for things that are more appropriate. And um, I have done what you had suggested. I eat more mostly in the morning and lunch. And then I've lost quite a bit of weight in the last 10 months. But um, I've, I eat a lot of hummus. And um, I, for lunch, I'll oftentimes just take a piece of pita bread. I guess I want your comments on this to see if I'm doing this right. But I'll take a piece of pita and put plenty of hummus on it with some cucumber and tomato and uh, I'm good to go. It, it really satisfies me. And I do that all the time. So you're getting uh, the hummus is definitely a healthy snack. Um, the veggies are definitely healthy. The pita, depending on how it's made, is the one thing that I would question. I'd look on the package ingredients and see how much fat they're putting into it. I would see how much salt that they're adding. Uh, you know, it's different for different companies. And remember, it's a, a fairly processed product. So uh, I know you, you know, you're kind of used to having something with a shell and that's okay. Uh, it sounds like you're, if you're losing weight and you're getting the benefits you want, if, if you don't have other problems like diabetes or high blood pressure or want to reverse heart disease, then I would say, if you're getting along okay, keep doing it and have fun, enjoy your life. If you wanted uh, to pro progress a little for further to the whole food plant-based, then you would um, potentially think, so what could I replace this processed uh, pita with? And yeah. it could be either a whole grain bread uh, which had more fiber in it. That's another thing you could look at in the pita. Generally, they've stripped out most of the fiber. It's more like a white bread in my experience, but I may be wrong. And the other option is to use a bowl as your shell. So you bring out a bowl and you set it on the table and you like the hummus 
what else do you like? Do you like a potato? You could put some potato in with that hummus, or you could put rice or quinoa with it. You could fill the bowl with some any vegetables that you like. Uh, you can, um, you know, and for dessert, have some fruit. So it's kind of a little different state of mind as far as do I need to have something to wrap up my food, or you could use something like uh, cucumber, not, yeah, cucumber or celery or carrot sticks that the hummus gets dipped in. And that will, that yeah, you know, you're probably doing that. But if you need that extra serving of whole grain, uh, then I would I would think a whole grain bread that has a five to one ratio. That means no more than five carbohydrates to every uh, gram of carbohydrate. A fiber. A fiber. I'm sorry. Thank I you. I am buying whole grain pita, but I don't. I will look at the labels. I'm not looking. Um, yeah, look at look at the uh, the whole grain pita and see how much fiber is in there. Multiply it by five, and then look at the carbohydrate. And if it's, um, you know, like if it's two grams of fiber, there shouldn't be over ten grams of carbohydrate. Okay, but I'll bet you it's closer to fifteen or twenty. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned diabetes. I am pushing the diabetes numbers. So I'm really trying to uh, change my diet to, you know, move in the right direction. So in that case, the root cause of diabetes is fat. Is fat. <laughs> so uh, if you're having a lot of fat, mm -hmm. uh, the hummus is an issue for those in the group. I've seen hummus that has that you buy in the store of uh, anywhere from 1.5 grams up to about 13 grams of, of fat. Okay. So you want to look on the label if you're going to be buying it from the store and get the probably no more than three or three and a half grams of fiber. And, and if you're still not getting the control on diabetes, I'd go to the one and a half um, or make it yourself where you just grind it up and leave out the tahini, which would be no additional fat. Okay. And, and that way you would get better control. So again, if you're eating foods as they're grown in nature, um, like the whole grain, when it says whole grain, if you're eating whole grain wheat or whole grain oats, or you're eating the beans, you're not gonna get over 10% fat total in your diet. If you're eating any processed foods, you're going to be pushing 15, maybe 20%, depending on. And then nuts. Uh, a small amount of nuts may be okay, but if you're you're still having problems with control, then you might do a trial of, of uh, stopping the quarter cup of nuts in your world and being careful about avocado and even olives that have high quantities of oil. Not that they're unhealthy foods, just if you want to get better control of the diabetes, those are kind of high fat foods. So be careful of those. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You can go to the diabetic lecture that Scott's put on the website. Oh. And, and you'll get that information. And Scott, you may have some resource or book that you can show where she could go for the diabetic section and then the new person can kind of see the website. Sure. Yeah, I'll pull it up. Get this there. Okay, while Scott's doing that, there is an oil-free hummus that the stores sell. It's King's Harvest. And I think Christine said she buys that sometimes. Which store sells that? Um, in Medford, it's Sherms, and I think you guys have a Sherms up there. I think we, we shop usually at either Whole Foods or at Market of Choice, where yeah, it, uh, she gets it, the hummus. It's called King's Harvest Hummus, and it's, a local, it's from Portland. 
and there's only 2.5 grams of fat and there's no tahini. It's garbanzo, sesame seeds, lemon juice, spices, and some salt. Okay. So yeah. Good to know. But that's just the plain regular hummus. Some of so if you're looking at the flavored ones, make sure you look because some of those ones do have oil. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Velvet. Maybe. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. And then here's the home page of the class website, livelifestylemedicine.com. So if you go to class archives, well, if anyone that's new, uh, you can actually scroll down here to the um, website tutorial and wa actually watch this recording. I kind of give a full tour of what's all available on the website and where everything's at and how to find it. Uh, so you can watch that when you get a chance. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can hover over class archives right here and go to 2022, that's this year. And then it goes in reverse order. So it goes back, our diabetes class, classes were back in March. So there's two of them here, March 22nd, diabetes class one and class two. So you can just click here and watch that. And then um, the book we recommend for diabetes, you go under resources, hover over that, and then there's books. You can click on that. And then we have different books for different classes, a whole list here. And there's one for diabetes right here, Mastering Diabetes by Cyrus Kambata and Robbie Barbaro. So they, they both have type one diabetes, but it's a really, really good comprehensive book on diabetes, pre-diabetes, type two diabetes, type one, type one and a half, all the different kinds of diabetes they talk about here and, and, uh, what, and kind of what to eat. And of course you can imagine it's whole, whole food plant-based, but um, so check read that if anyone that if you have diabetes yourself or pre-diabetes or um, want to learn more about diabetes definitely recommend reading this book okay. that's there um okay doing pretty good so far uh, so we're checking with the group again to see uh, any other questions, any other thoughts, anything burning on your mind that you'd like to talk about. If someone had a question last week, I'm trying to remember what it was. They were going to come back this week and ask it. I don't know if it was they're here or not. Well, you closed, the you closed last week by making a comment about calcium. Oh, yeah. Ah. And I jumped on that um, because I, I have, I'm supposed to take calcium every day. <laughs> All right, we, we can go back to that. Uh, before we do, Kyra has hand up. I know you talked about this before, but I didn't write it down in time. What were the dosages for the B12? Yeah, so it's uh, vitamin B12. So we recommend cyanocobalamin, which is that, that particular form, just because it has the most studies behind it. Uh, Dr. Greger, uh, he's reviewed those on, on on the on his website. And then, so what you want is if you are under age 65, you want 2,000 micrograms once a week. And if you are over age 65, you want 1,000 micrograms every day. So 2,000 micrograms once a week if you're under age 65, 1,000 micrograms daily if you're over age 65. That's a part I didn't get. Thank you so yeah. much. Sure. Okay, uh, we'll come back to some more questions. We're going to go to the um, hard drive and find <laughs> the calcium issues. Um, hopefully, you can see the screen and mm -hmm. do a little search here or where the calcium and osteoporosis issues are. If I can remember where they were, I think they were at 14, maybe 15. Not 14, that's autoimmune. Uh, okay, so here's the issues about are calcium supplements safe and are they effective? So let's play these couple videos and then we'll see if you have more questions. In 12 short years, government panels have gone from suggesting widespread calcium supplementation may be necessary to protect our bones, to do not supplement. 
what happened? It all started with a 2008 study in New Zealand. Short-term studies had shown that uh, calcium supplementation may drop blood pressures by about a point, though the effect appears transient, uh, disappearing after a few months, but better than nothing. And excess calcium in the gut can cause fat malabsorption by forming soap fat, uh, reducing saturated fat absorption, and increasing fecal saturated fat content. And indeed, if you take a couple tums along with your half bucket of KFC, up to twice as much fat could end up in your stool. And with less saturated fat absorbed into your system, your cholesterol might drop. So the New Zealand researchers were expecting to lower heart attack rates by giving women calcium supplements. To their surprise, there appeared to be more heart attacks in the calcium supplement group. Uh, was this just a fluke? All eyes turned to the Women's Health Initiative, the largest and longest randomized controlled trial of calcium supplementation. The name might sound familiar. That's the study that uncovered how dangerous hormone replacement therapy was. Would it do the same for calcium supplements? The Women's Health Initiative reported no adverse effects. However, the majority of participants were already taking calcium supplements before the study started. So effectively, the study was just comparing higher versus lower dose calcium supplementation, not calcium supplements versus no calcium supplements. But what if you go back and just see what happened to the women who started out not taking supplements, and then were randomized to the supplement group? Those who started calcium supplements suffered significantly more heart attacks or strokes. Thus, high dose or low dose, any calcium supplementation seems to increase cardiovascular disease risk. So researchers went back digging through other trial data for heart attack and stroke rates in women randomized to calcium supplements with or without vitamin D added, and confirmed the danger. And most of the population studies agreed. Users of calcium supplements tended to have increased rates of heart disease, stroke, and death. The supplement industry was not happy accusing the researchers of relying in part on self-reported data, like they just asked people if they had a heart attack or not, rather than verifying it. And indeed, uh, long-term calcium supplementation causes all sorts of uh, gastrointestinal distress, including twice the risk of being hospitalized with acute symptoms that may have been confused with a heart attack. But no, the increased risk was seen consistently across the trials, whether the heart attacks were verified or not. OK, but why do calcium supplements increase heart attack risk, but not calcium you get in your diet? Perhaps because when you take calcium pills, you get a spike of calcium in your bloodstream that you don't get just eating calcium-rich foods. Within hours of taking supplemental calcium, the calcium levels in the blood shoot up and can stay up as long as eight hours. This evidently produces what's called a hypercoagulable state. Uh, your blood clots more easily, which could increase the risk of clots in the heart and brain. And indeed, higher calcium blood levels are tied to higher heart attack and stroke rates, so the mechanism may be calcium supplements leading to unnaturally large, rapid, and sustained calcium levels in the blood, which can have a variety of potentially problematic effects. Calcium supplements have been widely embraced on the grounds that they are a natural and therefore safe way of preventing osteoporotic fractures. But it's now becoming clear that taking calcium in one or two daily doses is not natural, and that it does not reproduce the same metabolic effects as calcium in food, the way nature intended. And furthermore, the evidence is also becoming steadily stronger that calcium supplementation may not be safe. That's why most organizations providing advice regarding bone health now recommend that individuals should obtain their calcium requirement from diet in preference to supplements. But if we can't reach it through diet alone, would the benefits to the bones outweigh the risks to the heart? We'll find out next. So. That's the first video. And the second one is, are calcium supplements effective? And you can, we'll play this, and then we'll see if you have questions about this.
There has been an assumption for decades that as a natural element, calcium supplements must intrinsically be safe. But calcium supplementation is neither natural nor risk-free, but the same could be said for every medication on the planet. Yet doctors continue to write billions of prescriptions for drugs every year, because the hope, at least, is that the benefits outweigh the risks. So what about the benefits of calcium supplements? Yes, heart attacks and strokes can be devastating, but so can hip fractures. The risk of dying shoots up in the months following a hip fracture. About one in five women don't last a year after a hip fracture, and it may be even worse for men. On average, apparently cutting one's lifespan short by four or five years. And unfortunately, these dismal statistics don't seem to be getting much better. So even if calcium supplements caused a few heart attacks and strokes, if they prevented many more hip fractures, then it might result in a favorable risk-benefit ratio. So how effective are calcium supplements in preventing hip fractures? We've known that milk intake doesn't appear to help, but maybe that's because any potential benefit of the calcium in milk may be overshadowed by the increased risk of fracture and death associated with the galactose sugar in milk. Uh, but what about just the calcium in a calcium supplement alone? Calcium intake in general does not seem to be related to hip fracture risk at all. And when people have been given calcium supplements, uh, not only was there no reduction in hip fracture risk, an increased risk is possible. The randomized controlled trial suggests a 64% greater risk of hip fractures with calcium supplementation compared to just like getting a placebo sugar pill. Where did they even get this idea, then, that the calcium supplements might help our bones? It was this influential study in 1992 that found a combination of vitamin D and calcium supplements could reduce hip fracture rates 43%. But this was done on institutionalized women, like in a nursing home, who were vitamin D deficient. They weren't getting sufficient sun exposure. And so if you're vitamin D deficient and you take vitamin D and calcium, no surprise, your bones get better. But for women living independently out in the community, the latest official recommendations for cal calcium and vitamin D supplementation to prevent osteoporosis is unambiguous. Do not supplement. Why? Because in the absence of compelling evidence for benefit, taking supplements is not worth any risk, no matter how small. Now, this is not to say these supplements don't play a role in treating osteoporosis, or that vitamin D supplements might not be good for other things, but if you're just trying to prevent fractures, women living outside of institutions should not take them, and perhaps even in institutions. In this study, instead of giving nursing home residents vitamin D and calcium supplements, they randomized them to sunlight exposure and calcium supplements. And those that got the calcium pills had significantly increased mortality, lived shorter lives than the sunshine-only group. Although calcium supplements don't appear to prevent hip fractures, they may reduce overall fracture risk by like 10%. So here's how the risk-benefit shakes out. If 1,000 people took calcium supplements for five years, we would expect 14 excess heart attacks, meaning 14 people would have a heart attack that they would not have had if they had not started the calcium supplements. So they were effectively going to the store and buying something that gave them a heart attack plus 10 strokes that otherwise would not have happened, and 13 deaths. People would have been alive had they not started the supplements. But that's all balanced against the 26 fractures that would be prevented. Now it's no fun falling down, breaking your wrist or something, but I think most people would look at that risk-benefit analysis and conclude that you know, calcium supplements are doing more harm than good. Given these findings, the use of these supplements should be discouraged, and individuals advised to obtain calcium from their diet instead. Calcium supplements have been associated with elevated risk of myocardial infarction, heart attacks, whereas dietary calcium intake has not. How much calcium should we shoot for? Interestingly, unlike most other nutrients, there's no international consensus. Uh, for example, in the UK, the recommendation for adults is 700 mg a day. But across the pond in the U.S., it's up to 1,200 a day. Whenever I see that kind of huge discrepancy between government panels, I immediately think scientific uncertainty, political maneuverings, or both. 
newer data based on calcium balance studies in which researchers make detailed measurements of the calcium going in and out of people, suggest that the calcium requirements for men and women is lower than previously estimated. They found calcium balance was highly resistant to change across a broad range of intakes, meaning our body is not stupid. If we eat less calcium, our body absorbs more and excretes less. And if we eat more calcium, we absorb less and excrete more to stay in balance. Therefore, current evidence suggests that dietary calcium intake is not something most people need to worry about. This may explain why in most studies no relationship was found between calcium intake and bone loss anywhere in the skeleton, because the body just kind of takes care of it. Don't push it too far, though. I mean, once you get down to just a few hundred milligrams a day, you may significantly get more bone loss. Though there may not be great evidence to support the U.S. recommendations, the U.K. may have the right idea, shooting for between 500 and 1,000 mg a day from dietary sources, unless you've had gastric bypass surgery or something and need to take supplements. For most people, though, calcium supplements cannot be considered safe or effective for preventing bone fractures. So that's more than a mouthful, and I suspect some of you may have, uh, you know, listened to him very closely uh, if you're taking calcium. He said for prevention of bone fracture, uh, if you already have a condition called osteoporosis, I think... Uh, I don't know what the latest is on that. Scott, you might know going to the conferences that you went to as to whether uh, calcium is being used, but what gets lost in the discussion of, of someone who has osteoporosis and how to best treat them? What gets lost is the exercise and the resistance and the vitamin D and the other issues and the focus is placed on calcium, which is not generally even going to fix osteoporosis. So I'm not sure. What's your take on the overall, uh, someone who is diagnosed definitely with osteoporosis, has bone loss, and has had a prior fracture? Um, what's your thoughts? Yeah, well, as far as the the, just the, in the general medicine, they're still always talking about supplementation, but the, I don't think the regular providers know about this increased risk with, with heart attacks and strokes, so the lack of education there. But even in the conferences I go to, when, when dietitians present all the details of, of different nutrients that are needed and how, do you, can you meet all your needs on different various diets, including whole food plant-based diet, the consensus is it's very easy to get enough calcium. Even the higher inflated recommendations from the U.S., you can still even meet that with a whole food plant-based diet you know, by eating the, the uh, foods higher in calcium, which are your leafy greens and beans and things like that. But I would just say what you learned in those videos is the reason our, our uh, recommendations are so inflated is because of the dairy industry, the influence that they've had. So I would just stick with you know that five to seven hundred. And kind of the embarrassing thing is when some of those studies came out that Dr. Greger just showed there, there was kind of an uproar within the dairy industry. They're like, oh, because that was one of the things that they that they had, uh, rested their laurels on, where was oh, it's a good source of calcium. It's like, but so they actually had experts research the medical literature to find cases of calcium deficiency so that they could kind of point to that, so they could kind of justify having more dairy in your diet. And the embarrassing part was there they could not find any cal cases of calcium deficiency in the world literature. So it's like, oh, so like, oh, never mind. <laughs> so, so it's been one of those nutritional myths, just like, you know, there's no protein deficiency, there's no calcium deficiency either. So it, just like Dr. Gregor showed there, it, it's not a nutrient we need to worry about. Just get your calcium from food. Yeah, the vitamin D is the is the more the bigger issue because of the lack of sunshine and then like charlie said get your resistance exercise and weight bearing exercise and then don't smoke and um, eat a whole food plant-based diet and that's going to be the best thing you could do for your for your bone health whether you're trying to prevent osteoporosis or trying to actually treat it thank you scott 
How about Donna? Yeah. Um, well, I, I have a couple comments. I'm, I'm putting two and two together here. I noticed on Dr. Uh, Gregor's um, app on the 24 hour, I can't remember what it's called, but I downloaded the app. Yes, Daily and Dozen. Daily Dozen. And um, I clicked on some of the little informational icons, the little eyes. Yep. And uh, he he's very, and I haven't re haven't gone into a lot of depth yet, but he comments uh, on oxalate because of the kidney, you know, if you have kidney stones. And that's why I'm on calcium is because I had two bouts of kidney stones. And now it, after listening to this, it <laughs> dawns on me that the vegetables I cannot eat or I'm not supposed to eat because they're very high in oxalate are probably the ones that are high in calcium. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I hear what you're saying about the oxalate, but you can get plenty of calcium from other greens than, than the greens that are high in oxalate. Okay. So like, okay. like spinach is high in oxalate. Yeah. Beet, beets and beet greens are high in oxalates, but yes. arugula is not high in oxalates. Right. And neither is kale, neither is co collard greens. So, so I need to research the vegetables that are high in calcium. Right. So it's collard greens is the highest. It has 220 or 25 milligrams of collard green of calcium in one cup. Okay. So if you have a cup of collard greens a day, you'll be well uh, half of your calcium needs potentially okay. uh, will be fulfilled. And then uh, between another serving of uh, arugula or a serving of kale, you're going to get more. And then some beans, uh, you're going to get more. And you're going to keep adding that up. And you're ultimately uh -huh. going to have enough without okay. worrying about the oxalate. OK, great. Well, that answers that. That's, that's what I was curious about. Yeah, the three, the three, the three highest vegetables in oxalates are the yeah, like Charlie said, beet greens and uh, spinach and Swiss Swiss chard is the other one that's high in oxalate. But kind of interestingly, low oxalate diets don't prevent kidney stones. So it's kind of one of those. Oh, uh, I know, I know. It's like so you're I better know. off just eating a whole food plant based diet because it's like, well, what? Why are you spilling calcium in your urine? It's because of all the animal protein, all the high acidic pro-inflammatory acidic foods that are the meat and the dairy foods, that's what causes you to be in an acid acidosis state. So that's why you end up spilling people that eat more standard American diets, spill more calcium in their urine and thus form more kidney stones. So in general, there's a few cases where you still need to avoid the, the high oxalates uh, vegetables, but yeah, it's, it's very, you have a much less chance of developing kidney stones if you're on a whole food plant-based diet because you're not, because you're going to be alkaline, alkalinizing your diet, alkalinizing your urine. And so you're not going to form kidney stones in, in the first place. Got it. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Um, what other questions do we have? This has been fun so far. I have a question. Okay, Velvet, fire away. Um, I feel like I should know this, but I was doing a little experiment the other day. So <laughs> I like quick and easy because I'm busy, have a lot of go lots going on. So I eat just rolled oats, like the minute oats, and I know that isn't the greatest, but it's yeah. better than better than cereal. Anyway. So yes, it is. It, I, uh, there's nothing wrong with rolled oats, eating them raw or cooked. Nothing, no problem at all with that. So I bought some steel cut oats that are like seven minute ones that you can cook on the stove. But I looked at the, the um, labels and they're really pretty much identical. Yeah, so there might be a little more fiber in the steel cut oats. It was the same on both. Was it? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, is this really worth my time? And the steel cutouts don't taste as good, I feel like, for me. If they don't taste as good, just eat the rolled oats. They're fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's the conclusion I come to. Uh, 
from listening to other speakers who have talked about what they're eating and oatmeal is a common one. And uh, are they the five minute cooking rolled oats kind that you're eating or is it? No, they're the minute ones. <laughs> uh, I think they're a little bit more processed. So what's your take okay. on that, Scott? Maybe the old fashioned yeah. oats. That's what I eat. So I eat rolled oats, but they're just the regular I get them out at the at a local mill here. They're rolled at a local mill here in, in Eugene area. But but it, you could just do the old fashioned Quaker oats. But they're not. Yeah, they're just they're not the minute instant or the minute ones. They're just uh, you know, just rolled oats. But I when I make my oatmeal in the morning, it's it's four minutes in the microwave, and they're okay. they're still chewy. Uh, but I you know I have my oats in there, and my cinnamon, and my flax meal, and my raisins, mm -hmm. and my blueberries, and um, all that, and. Uh, and then, yeah, in four minutes, it's creamy and and I put some uh, oat milk in there too. Okay. And then it's really creamy and good. And there's but the but the rolled oats they're pretty thick cut, so they're still pretty chewy. So they're but they're not. Um, yeah, it's not like cream of wheat or anything. It's more and it's but they're not like steel cut where those would still be pretty pretty raw after just four minutes in the microwave. But yeah, the rolled oats. Yeah, and that's okay. Those would be fine. That's what I eat. I'll try that. Thank you. Yeah, Christine doesn't like the steel cut oats, but she does like groats, which are uh, the whole oat that didn't get cut with the steel blade, <laughs> but takes a lot longer to cook uh, unless you put it in the Instapot. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Kayeri, and then Ken. Hi, um, so... The mill where you get your oats, could we get the name of that mill? I think I know which oh, one. Oh yeah, it's the, the Camas mill out, uh -huh. of, out off Meadowview Road out there. Yeah, okay, great. It's kind of, they're and, kind of spendy. I think it's like $13 for a big, I get two big bags at a time. They're like, okay. they're like this, they're like this big, huge bags. And I go through two of those probably every couple months. <laughs> okay. But I just like, because I like to support local business and, and you know, it's not, you know, I can get for cooking. We just get the Quaker oats at Costco uh, for for recipes. But for when I make my oatmeal, I like to go out to the the Camas Country Mill out there. Okay. And the other question I had is, can you talk a little bit about? Um, oh, I'm gonna forget the word. The other place where you can get stones, gallstones. Oh, yeah. What what about them? Just you want to know more about just them? an overall like. Can you get rid of them? Um, what do they react to, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Well, there are, uh, so they're made of cholesterol in most, most uh, Americans, especially, because they're just, they're just basically crystallized cholesterol. So, they, so the gallbladder stores bile, so your liver makes bile, and then the gallbladder stores the bile. And the function of the bile is to, when you eat fat, fat goes into your, from the, from the stomach to the first part of the small intestine, your gallbladder contracts and squirts out bile into the small intestine to digest the fat. And, uh, but it, you know, when we eat the high fat American diet and the high cholesterol American diet, a lot of times the crystals start to form and it gets so concentrated with cholesterol that they form stones. So once you have stones, if you look at most of the studies, they're, they don't ever go away, they stay there. But if you switch to a whole food plant-based diet, you're not eating a high fat diet anymore. And so uh, there, is, there is a chance that if you go on a really low fat whole food plant-based diet the way we teach, and then you uh, suddenly kind of fall off the wagon and eat cheese pizza or something, you could actually have increased risk of having your gallbladder get sick because now it's all, you know, it's knowing that it's full of stones and it's got sludge in it. And now it's trying to contract to squirt bile into your intestine for that, that high fat cheese pizza you decided to eat. And then you have a higher chance of having your gallbladder get sick and have your gallbladder out, which is why um, when people tend to lose weight rapidly, they, go, they become higher risk of developing uh, their gallbladder to get sick and have to be taken out. But if you stick with a whole food plant-based diet and don't, you know, don't fall off the wagon, you'll your gallbladder will likely be fine, even if it's full of gallstones. There are some case reports, published case reports of gallstones dissolving away with with the diet change. Um, it's pretty isolated. Now there's not not a white not a lot of good studies or a lot of widespread. There there is like uh, I think it's ursodiol. Uh, uh, 
Charlie might know this, but um, to certain medications that 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 have some studies that show you can dissolve the gallstones. But what I try to tell patients that have worries about gallbladder, if you still have a gallbladder, and you or you know you have stones in your gallbladder, is you know just knowing the if you're losing weight and you're on a whole food plant based diet, and then you kind of fall off the wagon. That's where I give I tell my patients to be wary of that. That if that's one of the risks of kind of uh, rapid weight loss and falling off the wagon is if is you could your your gallbladder could take a hit. But um, so it's another motivator to kind of stay on track. But uh, so I don't know if that answered some. If there was more specific question, or did, that, did I answer your question? I really appreciate the answer. That does help. Um, when I've had a gallbladder attack, what gets me out of pain is taking um, diluted apple cider vinegar. Have you heard of that? No, not specifically for, yeah, for an actual no. gallbladder attack, but I, I, I could see that. Or what about you, Charlie? Yeah, so uh, in my experience, there are a number of people who are diagnosed with gallstones who choose not to have them out surgically and get by just fine by eating a diet that's relatively low fat. Uh, so eating the whole food plant-based diet will likely cut down on the number of attacks you have in the future. Uh, hopefully it eliminates them completely. Um, if the vinegar seems to help you, that's great. I haven't actually seen any controlled studies that show that that's effective, but if it works for you, that's what you do. But why is it that you're having those tacks intermittently? It probably is associated with some high fat food that you ate, uh, like a piece of pizza, or you know, you're out with friends or family that they made something that you're not making yourself, which has a higher quantity of fat, and then you wind up having an attack. Uh, so you must be very careful about the foods that you put in your mouth. If you're going to be eating out or eating at other places, uh, you're putting yourself kind of at risk of um, having future attacks. Um, so I guess that's all I have to say. If the attacks get too frequent and you get to the point that I've had enough. I don't want to go through this. Then you go to the surgeon, you have it out laparoscopically and you get by just fine. But again, you're told don't eat meals that are high in fat after the gallbladder surgery. So why not do that before you need it and see if your symptoms completely clear? Yeah, Lisa Chick was just commenting about she saw a lot of patients with <laughs> Gall, gall, gall stone attacks. We call it cholecystitis, but yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a very common. I've, I've had many patients with that come in with that, and it's pretty easy to diagnose actually. So, um, but yeah, so like Charlie said, sometimes it's best just to get it out if it if it's being too much of a problem. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Kim. I was paying attention, but I missed something. So Scott, if if the uh, bile's been sprayed out into the beginning of your small intestine to dissolve fat, mm -hmm. how does the fat get into the gallbladder to cause the stones? Well, it's the well, it's the the cholesterol gets in there because the blood supply. You know, there's so much cholesterol in the blood that it that it gets gets also gets into the gallbladder and form stones crystallizes so anything in concentration just like gout think about gout is crystallized uh uric acid and so if it gets too high enough in concentration in your blood it gets into your lymph fluid and everything else into your into the synovial fluid the base of the joints and then you get crystallized uric acid the same with with cholesterol it kind of if it's in your bloodstream because if it's high in your diet it's going to be everywhere in your body. And so it can form crystals in your gallbladder. And, and most, most Americans gallstones are made of cholesterol. Well, I got off on a side note uh, because we changed off of uh, breakfast cereal, but back to breakfast cereal for a minute. Um, so I, I, uh, I steam my growths in um, rice cooker and it, 
I only have to do it for 30 minutes. I put a little extra water in it, and my rice cooker requires a little extra water. So it works out great. And I eat a lot of collards as well. So I put them in the basket over the oat groats. And then I get um, oat groats and collards for breakfast. Um, I don't eat oats every day. I, I eat more beans and collards or beans and spinach than any oatmeal. I wanted to ask you about instant oatmeal. So I read at least one place that they do something, they add something to the oats to make them soft and ready to eat by just adding water, hot water. That's bad for you. And I, do you know anything about that? Like I won't eat uh, instant oatmeal anymore because I was convinced by things I read that it's bad, but I forgot why. Yeah, I'm not sure what they do in the process to make it cook faster. I, as my understanding is just they process it more, strip out more of the fiber because the fiber is what keeps it from cooking fa faster. It slows down the cooking process because it's, you know, it's hard. But uh, so it's kind of like instant oatmeal would be like shaved ice on the front lawn on a hot summer day, it melts really fast. So it gets absorbed and spikes your blood sugar really fast. Whereas oat groats would be like a block of ice on a hot summer day and it would take a while to melt that. So that would increase your blood sugar slowly it gets absorbed slowly. So that, but as far as what else they do to it to make it cook faster, I'm not sure. Yeah, so I just did a Google search on that. The only difference lies in the glycemic index, which you mentioned it gets uh, how quickly the food is absorbed into your blood blood uh, stream and so your blood sugar rises more quickly uh, with the instant oats um, but you need to be careful about some of the instant ones where they add additional sugar that's the other issue that if they're adding other components be careful of that excellent answers i'm going to go back to using instant oatmeal on my <laughs> <laughs> my climbing and hiking trips okay there you, you go need some quick because you need quick energy i guess huh oh yeah <laughs> that's great yeah, yeah when you're exercising it's not as big of an issue all right we're gonna go back to the view of the gallery and see if there are any other questions from anybody i'm sure that there is something burning on your mind or i suspect there is uh, and don't be shy. If you're thinking about it, someone else probably is. Marsha, you unmuted. Yeah, Scott, I'm getting your emails about the last two, three times, twice a week, Sunday and then either Monday or Tuesday. Yeah, it usually means that. So what I do is I send out an email on Sunday, every Sunday morning, and then when some when uh, I get an automatic prompt to send it out again for the people that don't open it. So if you don't open the class email on Sunday, you'll get it again on Tuesday morning usually. So just make sure you open it because then I don't know. It just basically says, oh, these numbers, this number of people haven't opened your email from Sunday. And so then I just send it out again because a lot of times uh, it goes to people's junk files. So I always tell people to make sure if you been getting the Sunday morning emails and then all of a sudden you'd stop getting them, make sure you check your junk file because sometimes that happens. We're just encour uh, encouraging you to do your homework. Look at the email and re read through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as, long uh, as, you as long as you open it on Sunday, you won't get it again on Tuesday. <laughs> I didn't have the answer to that at the afternoon class, so. Oh, they asked you that earlier? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Marsha asked that earlier. Yeah. I said, ask Scott tonight. <laughs> okay, anybody else who's uh, got anything they would like to share? Looks like Donna's I, got her hand up. Yeah, I just, I just have a little comment that... Uh, I wrote your uh, website down and I had a doctor's visit and I actually told my doctor about you guys and, uh, and about the plant-based group too. And I told her that's what I was doing, you know, and I was trying to learn this way. So 
I'm trying to pass the word. <laughs> what did she say? What was her response? She thought it was interesting. I don't know if she'll follow up or anything, but yeah, she was, she says I'm doing everything right. She really gave me kudos for everything. You know, I felt really good when I left. Good. But, uh, good. But, uh, um, well, maybe she'll become a member of Eugene Plant-Based Providers one day when she that, sees how you're doing. That, that was the, that was my uh, thought was that I realized as good of the doctor as she is, she may not have this nutrition education. So, um, and since I'm focusing entirely now on my nutrition and my health, I felt like I needed to bring her into the loop. Well, I'll let you in on a secret. I knew nothing about this 11 years ago. I was 63 or four years of age, 63, I think. And uh, it's been a, a learning curve for me to kind of, get up to speed. Scott has kind of pushed me along and, you know, shared articles and I try to keep up with him as best as I can. He, he's become quite the guru. And then of course the medical student who's here, Lisa Chick, she's pushed me along with questions about what do I do here or there? And so I need to learn about that. So, um, <laughs> don't you know, sell yourself. Don't sell yourself short, Charlie. You've been you're teaching these classes long before I ever did. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but you you've contributed a lot, and uh, it's been very uh, inspiring uh, to see the effort that you've made in this. And and uh, Donna, your doctor may one day uh, discover what we discovered uh, and jump on board and uh, be teaching the classes herself. We don't know. Yeah, well, Lisa, we see you. I'm just here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> you. You've been more than just here. Uh, you know, you created Facebook, and there's over 300 people on the Facebook uh, site now. And uh, kudos to you. And you've, you know, held sessions for your co-medical students and encourage them along. And, you know, you've, you've uh, gone well above and beyond uh, what would be considered uh, making a, trying to promote healthier lifestyle. So good for you. We're really inspired and proud of you. Well, all with your help. And speaking of which, I'll just throw it out here that next year in January, I'm hoping to start a book club. I'm throwing it out there so that I can be accountable for it now. No details in sight yet, but it's on my mind and I want to do it. And I want anyone here to be involved. So stay tuned for that. I think Marsha had a comment to make. Yeah, Marsha. Okay. I just wanted to mention, um, Eric Cogrove had done an eat loaf recipe. I made it and it wasn't that good, but in the <laughs> reverse, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. There's more to this. In the cookbook that uh, Caldwell Esselstein and his daughter and wife did, they yep. have an eat loaf in there. I made that and it's wonderful. It is wonderful. You can't go wrong with that recipe at all. Has no, flaxy egg in it or anything was that in the book how to prevent and reverse heart yes, disease that, yes that's the first book that we ever used for recipes also yeah it's a good, it's, good good cookbook it's a meatloaf recipe you say it's like it's just like a meatloaf my husband even took a whole portion like this big of a piece yeah and he took it to work so i thought that was pretty good <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And Lisa, Our, as far I, as the book club goes, Lisa, if you uh, get that going, just let me know. I can put it up on our website. That'd be great. When you get it. <laughs> Not if. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when. Uh, it's when. So know. <laughs> you know, you'll have more than one person show up. Yeah, I've got a few. Um, chats in the in the chat box about it um i'll probably send out a survey to scott and see what people would like to do and what they'd like to read okay that's great 
you can also share that with the lifestyle medicine group uh, at you know the schools or the integrative medicine group you know um, at both schools just a thought Hey, another cookbook to add to your guys's repertoire is how to be um, a plant-based woman warrior and it is by Jane Esselton and her mom oh. yeah so Caldwell Esselton's wife and his daughter I think oh that's great and yeah his wife Anne and Jane is his uh yeah daughter yeah. Jane yes daughter-in-law yeah yeah really good recipes in there what was the name of the book you said charlie uh i the name was how to be a plant-based woman warrior no, woman what? warrior okay mm -hmm. they, also, they also have a youtube channel and they do videos together they're pretty cute they're very cute i agree okay kim so I just had two comments. Um, the first one is, if anybody wants to join me on that vegan cruise that Ocean Robbins is putting together, it's in March in the Caribbean and all the big wigs are gonna be there. I mean, not all, but Gregor and Dr. Neil Bernard. And it's not that expensive and it's a lot of lectures and vegan food and some great locations. So um, it's on their Food Revolution website, okay. I think. Okay, and what are the dates? 23rd i think to the 29th i think it's something like that march okay. march next so, year so it's six days i, and I it's think it's seven i think it's seven, seven days yeah okay and it's and, on um, a on a cruise ship like a carnival cruise it's the vegan version <laughs> the vegan version of carnival <laughs> of carnival cruise or something like that huh yeah i'm su okay. i'm super envious that would be that would be really fun i know hey, Dr. come McDougal, join me come yeah, join well, me i've already uh, i've already gone to all those conferences i already got I've been used up all my time off for nutrition conferences but um, um yeah dr McDougal used to do them every year for a long time he used to go to costa rica and all over he used to have the McDougal cruises and stuff he doesn't do those anymore but yeah i saw i saw that one and thought oh that would be cool yeah it should be fun but and another thing um i was listening to the radio there was a report about kaiser um hospitals actually providing healthy meals to patients um in the bay area as a an experiment it's like a pilot program wow and they're, they're whole food plant-based nice so, I just want to let you know that you know there this kind of stuff is happening more and more which is great you're making us feel better <laughs> not a lot of good news but <laughs> that's good <news. laughs> that's great uh we've been doing pretty good so far are there any further questions uh before we kind of say okay we're good for another week uh, we still have a few more minutes if you like, but if not, it's okay too. People were asking about the name of that cookbook that uh, Velvet was mentioning there. I think I put it in there correctly in the chat. Uh, it's, yeah, chat. How to Be a Plant-Based Woman Warrior by Jane and Ann Esselstyn. Very good. Okay. So we went over vitamin B12. Um, for those of you who are living in Oregon, uh, we didn't go over vitamin D3. Um, and so if you're getting enough sun, which most of us don't get enough sun, we wear clothes, uh, we probably should be taking 2000 international units a day, according to Gregor. Um, sometimes I take up to 4,000 a day when I'm really going a week without any sun exposure. Uh, but I've been, I've monitored my vitamin D levels, that sort of thing. So I know that it's okay. I think it's a safe amount to take. Uh, 
the best thing for those of you who are in other areas, if you can get some sun like California, you might not need to take a supplement, but consider taking it uh, because in Oregon, because I know when I was doing studies and uh, about one out of every three or four people is low or a three out of every four, basically, a lot of people are low. Yes, Marcia. I know I live in Montana and they say, the doctors here say the intensity of the sun and the lack of sun, because we live in a valley, so we don't even get much sunlight during the day, um, is better to take a D3. It's good. Okay. Now, thank you for that. Now, the other issue is Dr. Greger had a video on uh, vitamin K, K2. There has been some uh, controversy about whether you should be taking vitamin K or not. Is anybody in our group taking vitamin K separately or think that they need to? Because if you do, then you probably should be looking at this video. So can I see, uh, is it uh, K area? Are you taking it? I am, and I've taken it for a while. And the reason I take it is that when I don't take it, I easily bruise. All right. Um, I don't think the bruising issue was discussed. Um, so I don't know what to say about that other than if it works for you, it works for you. Is anybody else taking vitamin K? No one else? I think it's a good enough video that I think we should share it with the group. Um, because you're gonna see, you know, there's a lot of people who are out trying to sell you stuff. And so, I'm going to go to my email and see if I can find it here real quickly. Yeah, it just came out this week. I saw that. It was pretty good. I I learned a little bit from it and or a lot. And here is the purported benefits. Should we be taking it? I think that's the one on Monday. Yeah. Video of the day. It's not too long. Here we go. Vitamin K. Wait, I know about vitamins A, B, C, D, and E. What happened to vitamins F, G, H, I, and J? It's not alphabetical. Vitamin K stands for coagulation, or at least it does in German. That's the fundamental role vitamin K plays, helping the blood to clot. But over the last few decades, there's evidence that it has other roles in the health of our bones, heart, and brain. Kind of reminds me of vitamin D. I mean, we know vitamin D is important for bone health, but then there's been all sorts of other controversial functions ascribed to it, some of which have been proven and some disproven. What about vitamin K? For bone health, for example, is the link between vitamin K and osteoporosis myth or reality? It turns out the findings on vitamin K in bone are conflicting and unclear. It doesn't help that some of the major trials were found to be problematic, to say the least, as in likely fraudulent, containing impossible data, with investigators admitting to complete fabrication. And so if you do a systematic review eliminating any fraud, we find there's no evidence that vitamin K supplementation affects bone mineral density or vertebral fractures. What about the heart? Vitamin K supplementation for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, there's a vitamin K-activated protein in your blood that binds up excess calcium and helps prevent calcium from being deposited into the walls of your arteries and stiffening them. So if you give people extra vitamin K, will that protect people's arteries from calcification? I mean, it sounds good in theory, but no. Vitamin K does not appear to consistently prevent progression of calcification, atherosclerosis, or arterial stiffness. 
For example, artery calcifications, particularly common in patients with chronic kidney disease, which can lead to increased artery stiffness, which is an important risk factor for heart attacks and strokes. An earlier trial didn't find any benefit on coronary artery calcification between the vitamin K and placebo groups, but they were using kind of a small dose. So these trials use a whopping dose daily for a year, and nada. Vitamin K supplementation did not improve vascular stiffness or other measures of artery health. And in fact, one study on the effect of vitamin K supplementation on artery calcification in patients with diabetes found that calcification tended to increase after supplementation with a type of vitamin K found in a slimy fermented soy food called natto. Now, those with higher levels of vitamin K circulating in their bloodstreams do tend to have lower levels of inflammation, but no wonder. Where is vitamin K found? The predominant dietary form of vitamin K in the human diet comes from dark green leafy vegetables and cruciferous vegetables. So how did people get high levels in their blood? Eating broccoli. Those with higher levels of vitamin K in their blood were eating more vegetables, less meat. No wonder they had lower levels of inflammation. The recommended adequate daily intake for vitamin K is set at 70 micrograms a day in Europe, and between 90 and 120 a day here in the United States. Just two leaves of kale has over 70, and a quarter cup of cooked kale will get anyone all the K they need for the day. Now, there is vitamin K found in meat, dairy, and eggs, averaging about 5 to 10 micrograms per serving. In other words, they are even beaten out by iceberg lettuce, which is mostly water, but still contains like two to three times more vitamin K. Ah, but that's vitamin K1. What's found in animal products is mostly vitamin K2. Do you need K2? Apparently not. Once you get enough plant-based K1, there's no established requirement for K2, because it hasn't been proven that K2 has effects that are different from K1. They both act the same way in the body, thus there's not even enough data to take K2 into account at all. So when the recommended adequate daily intakes are set, they're only talking about getting enough K1 from plants, mostly green vegetables. In fact, most of the bone trials that flopped used the K2 found in animal products, and most of the failed heart studies used K2 as well. OK, even though there's presently a lack of randomized trial evidence to support a beneficial role for vitamin K in preventing the worsening of cardiovascular disease or bone health, what if that were to change? What if all of a sudden K2 was shown to have unique benefits? Well, guess what? The bacteria in your gut make K2. That's why fermented foods have K2. Bacteria make it. And the bacteria in your gut not only make it, but it gets absorbed from your colon up into your system, contributing a significant amount of the human vitamin K requirement, just in case you miss a couple days of greens. Vitamin K1 is made by plants and is the primary dietary form. Then there are a dozen or so types of vitamin K2, which are synthesized by bacteria, including several types in the human gut. The exception, though, is a type of K2 called menaquinone 4, MK4, which is endogenously synthesized in mammals and therefore is found in animal products. Now, I don't know if any of you noticed, but were mammals too? It has consistently been shown that vitamin K1 from greens is endogenously converted inside your body to the vitamin K2 in animal products. You're made out of meat, too, though it took until 2010 before we discovered the human biosynthetic enzyme that does it. So no reason at all to take any sort of vitamin K supplement. Eat your greens. In fact, when K2 supplements were looked at, researchers found significant problems in terms of contaminants and mislabeling. Eat your greens. Now, K2 appears in higher concentrations in certain tissues, including the brain. Again, we make K2 from the K1 we eat in greens, but maybe extra K2 might help? Well, if we measure vitamin K levels in the blood and brains of centenarians, or those that live over 100, concentrations of circulating K1 from vegetables, but not cerebral K2, not the K2 in the brain, was positively correlated with a wide range of cognitive measures. Why? Likely because they were eating green vegetables, and green vegetables don't just have vitamin K. Green leafy vegetables are the most concentrated source of lutein, the eye health nutrient that's taken up into the brain and is associated with cognitive performance across the lifespan. 
And so in these centenarians, circulating K1 and lutein concentrations were highly correlated, so it's hard to tease out exactly what in greens was so beneficial. It's like when you see data showing lower circulating K1 levels in the bloodstream are associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality, meaning lower K1 levels were correlated with a shorter lifespan. Well, duh! K1 is found in greens, and of all the dietary components correlated with all-cause mortality, the best evidence appears to support the intake of green leafy vegetables and salads to reduce all-cause mortality. In other words, eat your greens. So I think he made the point. Um, so if you're taking vitamin K uh, to prevent bruising, it could be that the bruising was occurring because you weren't eating enough greens. Now that may not be the case, but uh, if you weren't eating maybe like three cupfuls of greens a day, different kinds of greens. Uh, maybe you could try that and see if the bruising uh, clears without taking the vitamin K. Uh, it would save you some money and uh, you'd probably be healthier. Just my thought. Yeah, I, I came to the same conclusion on, from watching the video. Thanks. <laughs> 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 okay, well, glad that you could come. We're glad we played it and, you know, see how it works. And if it doesn't, let us know so that we can put it in our memory banks. Um, this has been great, fun. Any last questions before we hit the road for next week? Uh, Hank here. One small question. Yes, uh, Hank. Dolly has had a stroke, blood clot stroke, and I'm taking Eliquis to lower my clotting potential because I have AFib. Uh, would vitamin K be counterproductive for us? I, uh, you know, I wouldn't take vitamin K uh, to, uh, if you're taking Eliquis, I, but you could eat whatever you want. Um, and if you're taking Coumadin, uh, we tell people just adjust your Coumadin dosage uh, to keep it in the uh, correct uh, pro time INR window. Uh, so yeah, taking vitamin K additionally would not be something I would recommend that you do. Thank you. I think that, I think that uh, vitamin that. Um, Eliquis works on a different principle than warfarin and doesn't involve uh, vitamin K. I may be wrong, but I think I remember that. I also take a blood thinner, Perdaxa, and it works on a different mechanism than warfarin, which is that's, vitamin That's K. correct. Yeah, that's correct. There's yeah. a clotting cascade and there's vitamin K dependent clotting factors and the Coumadin effects is works on that, on that co uh, coagulation cascade in the Eloquis and the other one's got a different different mechanism, you see you're correct. But specifically to Hank's question, if you want to keep your blood thinner, you don't want to be adding more additional vitamin K. Uh, however, when you're getting it from the plants, like uh, if you're saying, well, does that mean we shouldn't be eating dark green or, or the green leafies? It actually, you tend to have, um, I've read before, somewhat like of an aspirin thinning effect overall when you're eating a whole plant-based diet. And so eating the extra uh, greens is uh, not going to be detrimental to you. Okay? Yeah, thanks. I think that's what you were probably more interested in, because you're not going out and buying the supplement. Okay, I get it now. Yeah, not to worry about the greens you're eating. In your food. Okay, anybody else? Man, this has been fun. Yeah, it's good. I'll I'll put uh, open forum and I'll maybe I'll put uh, vitamin supplements as kind of was kind of the theme tonight a little bit, huh? Yeah. Vitamin supplements, yeah, that's including calcium and that other stuff, I, yeah. or just supplements or whatever. 
Yeah. Okay, thanks for everybody's input, all your questions, all your input. It's been wonderful. Scott, thank you. Yeah. See you guys next week and bring your questions. If you uh, think mm -hmm. up some questions to bring to class next week, It'd be fun. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank Hi. you. You're very welcome. Thanks. I just need to find the leave button here. Can't seem and, to find and recording. <laughs> yeah, I've got a